Anyway, so that takes me to my decode segment uh, because it's not about forcing the vote, but it is about um, how it's important to uh, differentiate between identity politics that I think do matter, right? And identity politics that gets used by uh, corporate Democrats for cynical reasons. So let's get to it. In August of 2018, Senator Elizabeth Warren gave a pretty lengthy speech announcing her proposal to root out corruption in government. Uh, She felt that uh, money in politics had its grips in Washington and as a result, were not able to pass the type of legislation that ordinary Americans absolutely deserve. Here's what she had to say specifically about how paid speeches impact corruption and what gets done in Washington. Take a look. Restore faith that ordinary people can get a fair shake in our courts. For starters, strengthen the code of conduct for all federal judges. No stock trading, no payments from corporations for attending events, no honoraria for giving speeches, no lavish getaways and fancy hunting trips funded by billionaires. And I mean all federal judges, including Supreme Court justices. So what she's talking about there is incredibly important, and it's an issue that impacts pretty much anyone in a position of power in our government. In that case, she's talking about federal judges, Supreme Court justices, uh, but this is certainly something that has uh, impacted members of Congress. We have this revolving door of politics, and the whole idea is that as soon as these lawmakers are um, out of public office, they'll then turn to, uh, you know, lobbying firms, uh, corporations, and places where uh, they usually make incredible amounts of money simply due to their influence and their ties to Washington. This corruption is real. It's something that Elizabeth Warren was actually absolutely right about. Now, unfortunately, since that speech was given by Warren, not much has changed. And today we find ourselves uh, dealing with very similar situations. In fact, recently Politico wrote about how uh, Biden's pick for Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen um, has been paid quite a bit of money in the last two years uh, by Wall Street, uh, you know, firms who you know want to pay her a ton of money to give speeches. So I want to read you a few excerpts from what Politico has written, and then it's important to focus on the response by blue checkmark resistance types on Twitter, because it's a perfect example of how identity politics gets used cynically to hinder any real critique of flaws in our political system. So Politico writes that in the past two years, President-elect Joe Biden's pick to be Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has raked in more than $7.2 million in speaking fees from Wall Street and large corporations, including Citi, Goldman Sachs, Google, Citi National Bank, UBS, Citadel LLC, Barclays, Credit Suisse, Salesforce, and more. This is pretty big Wall Street firms. There's no question. Um, In fact, Yellen brought in nearly $1 million, giving nine speeches to Citi alone. Remember, this is just in the last two years, guys. This is not throughout her entire career. She earned more than $800,000 speaking to Citadel, a hedge fund founded by the Republican mega donor Ken Griffin. She also spoke to the law and lobbying firm, um, law and lobbying firm Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, Pittman. Along with her disclosures, by the way, Yellen pledged to go to Treasury's ethics lawyers to seek written authorization to participate personally and uh, substantially in any particular matter that involves a firm she received compensation from in the prior year. But keep in mind that she very recently gave um, a speech to Citi. Uh, She received speaking fees when she gave that speech in October of 2020, again, very recently. And so um, if she followed through with that ethics uh, proposal, essentially she would only consult with the department's ethics lawyers until October of 2021. Now, this is a big problem. Uh, for reasons that I will get even more detailed about in just a minute. Um, But apparently some don't feel that this is a problem. The same blue check marks on Twitter who are very much concerned about Donald Trump's conflicts of interest, uh, violations of the emoluments clause, how the Kushners were still very much in business uh, with real estate dealings while Kushner was serving as a top advisor to the president. All of those people who are concerned about all of those things are now suddenly saying, How dare you attack Janet Yellen 
this is misogynistic, as if the real critique here doesn't have any substance. And I think that's ridiculous. Let me give you some examples, starting with Matt McDermott, who's the VP of a political consulting firm. Um, he says he's appalled uh, by what he perceives as pure sexism, repeatedly chastising women and only women for harnessing, harnessing their intellect and expertise to earn speaking fees is absolutely a misogynistic attack. It's also a remarkably hypocri hypocritical attack coming from journalists who themselves regularly earn speaking fees. Now, I agree with him about journalists earning speaking fees. It definitely matters where the speaking fees are coming from. Um, and so I think that it's a nuanced situation. In this case, we're talking about a possible treasury secretary getting paid millions of dollars, $7.2 million, million dollars over the last two years, there's a clear conflict of interest there. That is a problem. Um, and by the way, it's also not remotely true that Politico only focused on Janet Yellen. In fact, in that same article, there was some focus on a male pick by uh, the Biden team, Anthony Blinken. Anthony Blinken, uh, Biden's nominee to be Secretary of State, disclosed the clients he advised through West Exec advi Advisors, the consulting firm he co-founded with other Obama administration alumni. Those clients included uh, the investment giant Blackstone, Bank of America, Facebook, Uber, McKinsey and Company, the Japanese conglomerate SoftBank, uh, the pharmaceutical company Gilead, the investment bank Lazard, Boeing, AT&T, I mean, this, the list goes on and on, the Royal Bank of Canada, LinkedIn, and the uh, and Sotheby's Auction House. So the list goes on and on. More importantly, uh, to all the critics, there was emphasis on a male person who's tied to the Biden team as well. Uh, but that was left out of the criticism that McDermott put out there. Now, other critics of Politico's reporting uh, tried to draw false equivalencies between uh, those who went after Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for being a bartender and, you know, people who are now criticizing Janet Yellen for the money that she made uh, speaking to uh, Wall Street executives. Here's an example. The people who belittle AOC for being a former waitress are the same faulting Janet Yellen for earning $7.2 million. So how much exactly should women make? Except um, it's not the same people. Uh, there are people on the left, uh, well-intentioned people who have genuine and legitimate concerns about what's happening right now with money in politics. Now, money in politics isn't the end-all be-all uh, regarding our political system and how we need to fix it, but it is an influencing factor that we need to address. And that argument was absolutely ridiculous because as we know, those who have minimized AOC's accomplishments are usually people like Ben Shapiro who like to point out the fact that she used to be a, a, a bartender. But being a bartender isn't a conflict of interest if you want to be a public servant. Getting paid millions of dollars by Wall Street uh, when you're possibly about to be a treasury secretary is a giant conflict of interest. One more example. So AOC is faulted for being a waitress that doesn't make enough money. And now ja Janet Yellen is being faulted for being a baller that makes too much money. I'm starting to think the real problem is the rampant and pervasive sexism that is still allowed to invade too many opinions. So I do want to address that because, again, this isn't about how much money Janet Yellen has made. If Janet Yellen had made I don't know, a million dollars the way Bernie Sanders did by writing a book after running uh, for president in 2016, that was well-earned money. That's not a conflict of interest. That has nothing to do with how he performs his job. It wouldn't have anything to do with how Janet Yellen would prefer, uh, perform her job. But that's not the case here. This isn't about the amount of money she's made. It's about how she's made it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, one other person, and that's, of course, Stephanie Rule. Stephanie Rule was outraged about this reporting from Politico, where she wrote, seriously, are you kidding me? Do better, Politico. Janet Yellen was paid market value. But listen, to be fair to um, Stephanie Rule, she's consistent. I mean, she seems to love conflicts of interest. Uh, she's a walking you know, poster child for conflicts of interest is someone who worked um, as a hedge fund salesperson and then immediately pivoted to anchoring the news on MSNBC. And by the way, uh, just recently she faced some backlash for appearing in a chase ad.
this one. Hey, this is Stephanie Rule, and I'm looking forward to my conversation with Chase, where we talk about life's unpredictable moments and how important it is to save and plan for them. I hope you're going to join us. Jay Williams and I are going to dig into all the crazy things we're dealing with in our lives right now and how we can best prepare for them. Uh, I'm excited to be part of Chase Chat's webcast. I hope you'll join us. So apparently there was enough backlash toward that ad that um, finally Chase decided to uh, distance themselves uh, from Stephanie Rule. Chase Bank to stop using MSNBC's rule in uh, promotional ads after conflict of interest concerns. So it looks like conflicts of interest really do serve as a concern for Americans who want fair reporting, who want accurate representation in Congress, who just want to be represented appropriately without corrupting factors like, you know, paid speeches, uh, promotional partnerships and things like that. So there seems to be an acknowledgement that a conflict of interest is a problem here. Uh, but for some reason, Using that argument in the context of Janet Yellen getting paid $7.2 million over the last two years for giving Wall Street speeches is unacceptable because it's allegedly misogynistic. I'm here to tell you that it is not. It is not misogynistic because what we're talking about here is the substance of what influences politicians and people who serve in government. We're not talking about whether or not Janet Yellen is fit for the job because she's a woman. We're talking about whether or not she's fit for the job based on influencing factors behind the scenes, based on conflicts of interest, based on corruption. And to give you other examples of how this has been accepted in the past as an issue in other contexts. Let's talk about how uh, Hillary Clinton was criticized for her Wall Street speeches when she was running in the Democratic primary in 2016. Look, it was clear that she had taken giant sums of money for her Wall Street speeches. Uh, she refused to release the transcripts of those speeches, you know, to all the people who think, no, this is just about a woman getting paid for her expertise. Okay, great, we'd love to read your expertise. Can you release the transcripts? She refused to do so. And then, of course, WikiLeaks uh, got a hold of Podesta's emails and put out more details about what was in those Wall Street speeches. Let's watch. One of the ironies of this story is that we know about these emails at all because the campaign itself did self-opposition research to find what in her Goldman Sachs speeches could prove damaging should they leak. Among the stuff that's gotten the most attention is Clinton saying that Dodd-Frank, Obama's signature initiative to reign in Wall Street, was, quote, passed for political reasons. You can see her aides in the emails internally debating how to make sure that her apparent tone deafness around Wall Street didn't seep out into the public. One example that really drives this home is that right after the campaign launched, Bill Clinton was planning on giving a speech at Morgan Stanley. And Clinton's aides freaked out about this. They said, this is something we shouldn't do. And Hillary herself appeared to be okay with it. Now, again, if you are a Clinton fan, you probably don't think that's a big deal. You probably think that Clinton and her husband can march into Wall Street, say what they need to say, collect the money, and not change their viewpoints at all. I have never, ever been influenced in a view or a vote by anyone who has given me any kind not, of funding. But it does speak to, I think, something that we've long suspected, which is that Hillary herself doesn't really see the political ramifications for appearing close to Wall Street or doesn't care. Now, after, Wa after WikiLeaks released even more emails, uh, we learned more details into uh, what Hillary Clinton was telling these Wall Street executives during these uh, lucrative speeches. And uh, doesn't look so good. It was definitely a liability for her campaign. Watch. But as a highly paid speaker, Clinton appears to have told the bankers, the people that know the industry better than anybody are the people who work in the industry. In the emails released by WikiLeaks, not authenticated by Clinton or NBC News, she also said new banking regulations after the 2008 crisis were passed for political reasons. And the jury is still out on the 2010 Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform law. And a stolen email WikiLeaks says was to campaign chairman John Podesta and others last October reveals Clinton decided to oppose the TPP trade deal she once supported even before seeing the final version, contrary to her later claim. An advisor writing, if she weighs in now without viewing the document, some in labor might wonder why she didn't just say she opposed earlier. 
So clearly, uh, Wall Street wasn't hiring her for her expertise, especially when in her speeches she was telling them, you guys are better suited to understand these issues than people like me. So what was that money paid for? Clearly, it was meant to influence Hillary Clinton, to let her know who her real bosses are. And again, that was uh, pretty widely accept, uh, accepted as a problem, as a liability for her campaign, especially at a time when so many Americans uh, couldn't recover from the 2008 economic collapse. And the situation for many Americans has actually gotten much worse, especially because of this pandemic. So I think it's pretty important for the American people to understand the type of corruption at play at this very moment, especially when it comes to people in positions of power who get to decide what kind of relief we get, what kind of austerity gets passed in the future, what kind of tax cuts get promoted for the wealthy. These are issues that matter to us. We should know about how how much she's getting paid by Wall Street firms. But let me tell you uh, how this is a problem in other contexts, in case people think that this is a little too political. Oh, maybe we need to focus on, I don't know, the healthcare industry. We know that there's quite a bit of corruption in that regard as well. And, um, you know, moving away from politicians and looking at the medical field, corruption has been a huge problem for decades and paid speeches are a huge part of it. This next video is a little older, it's 12 years old, but it's important to understand just how paid speeches have influenced the medical field. Take a look. The Downings blame Candace's suicide on the antidepressant drug Zoloft. They wondered why the doctor gave such a powerful drug when Candace's only complaint was anxiety in school. Then recently, in their lawsuit against the doctor, they think they found an answer. And I said, wait a second, what? Wait a second, because Candace's doctor, Matemi Selassie, had been paid around $12,000 making speeches touting Zoloft, with some of the payments coming from Pfizer, the drug's manufacturer. The Downings believe the money influenced the prescription. So luckily, there has been some progress on this front, um, something that, you know, people aren't talking about much, but Matt Brunig uh, tweeted about it, and I looked into it more. Um, under the Trump administration, believe it or not, the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General found that pharma-funded speaking engagements featuring doctors are typically illegal kickback programs. So even the Inspector General in the Department of Health and Human Services acknowledges that these paid speeches are um, a corrupting factor in how uh, doctors prescribe certain drugs, which is incredibly important to acknowledge, especially as the opioid epidemic continues to tear across this country. The Office of Inspector General expressed significant concerns about companies' use of paid physician speakers based on the OIG's investigation and enforcement actions and declared that paid speaker programs are often used to induce referrals or use the company's products. This is according to what was recently written um, in the National Law Review. This is coming from, again, the inspector general uh, within the Department of Health and Human Services. Pharmaceutical and device companies have settled numerous false claims acts, um, um, numerous false claim act cases involving speaker programs over the years for substantial uh, sums, notably including a June 2020 $642 million settlement with the United States centered on allegations regarding regarding the company's speaker programs. So clearly, guys, this is a problem. It's been acknowledged as a problem, both in politics, in the healthcare industry. Again, it is a corrupting factor in how decisions are made. This has nothing to do with misogyny. This has absolutely nothing to do with sexism. This has everything to do with the substance of this matter. And anyone who tries to make this an identity politics issue is doing so in a cynical way. They're trying to deflect. They're trying to pretend as though this is not a problem when it clearly is. And I'm sick of people using gender, using race, using whatever identity they choose to use for any particular reason uh, in order to uh, deflect from a very real problem that we're experiencing in this country. Uh, the National Law Review, by the way, continued to write that in the special fraud alert, the OIG noted drug and device companies paid nearly $2 billion to healthcare professionals for speaking-related services in the last three years. 
Now, someone who really seemed to understand how corruption works, how these paid speeches have a negative influence on uh, people in positions of power, um, so, of course, is Senator Elizabeth Warren. We heard from her earlier in this segment. Uh, she wanted to do something about this. And she even criticized Barack Obama back in 2017 for giving a $400,000 speech uh, that was paid by a Wall Street firm at a healthcare conference. Here's what she had to say about that at the time. Senator Warren, what do you think about President Obama accepting $400,000 from Wall Street? Well, I was uh, troubled by that. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is the influence of money. I, I describe it as a, you know, a snake that slithers through Washington. Snake that slithers through Washington. So um, what does Warren think about the recent controversy regarding Janet Yellen and how much she's made over the last two years by giving these speeches? Well, Politico concluded its report by saying a spokesperson for Senator Elizabeth Warren, who has been critical of the revolving door between government officials and corporations, did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The progressive Massachusetts senator previously called Yellen an outstanding choice. I just want to reiterate, this has nothing to do with sexism. This has everything to do with what influences people in positions of power. This is a conflict of interest. It's a real problem. It has nothing to do with any identity. It has everything to do with ensuring that we keep our lawmakers and uh, members of Biden's cabinet as honest as we possibly can. Now, that's an incredibly difficult thing to do, as we've learned throughout the years, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that people are educated about what's going on behind the scenes. It's important for people to understand what kind of flaws we have in our system. That way we can identify those flaws and actually work to change them. And the people who are trying to stop us from doing that are people who cynically use identity politics to deflect from the very real problems that we're experiencing in government today. Interesting choice for Senator Warren to call money and politics like a snake that slithers through the system. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I was I was led to believe just a few months ago that that using that kind of terminology was was problematic uh, by Elizabeth Warren herself. Um, you know, this 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 issue is it's it's remarkable to me and it shows how far to the right American politics has become. Like we, we talk a lot about polarization and the sort of conventional wisdom line on polarization is that the parties are kind of moving away from each other. And that's not true. Both parties are moving to the right. They're just kind of sorting themselves out into um, very distinct camps. Because it used to be with the issue of things like money and politics, it used to be that the standard liberal line was that you did not need a piece of paper that showed a literal quid pro quo in which someone was like, I believe in taking down the banks. Here's a million dollars. I believe that the banks are, you know what I mean? Like what Hillary Clinton is saying yep. there, that sort of incredibly narrow definition of like, I've never changed one of my views uh, in exchange for money. That's like, think about how narrow that is. And it, it, and it, and it, it, it just used to be that the line of the, the liberal line was like even the appearance of the corruption was enough mm -hmm. because it isn't the it, it's never the case that it's like they take some like firebrand uh, reformer and then pay him off and then they they kind of turn into a complete shill. That's not really how it works. I mean, obviously, there's examples of that. But the, the sort of more structural critique is that it kind of flows both ways. And, and it's much softer than that. It's much kind of, um, it happens on a, on, a, on a sort of deeper level. It's like the famous uh, Chomsky interview where he's talking to like some BBC guy, um, or I don't know if he's from the BBC, so some British uh, journalist. And he's like, he's like, but I've never taken orders from someone to change my views. And Chomsky's like, yeah, because if you, but if you didn't, if you believed a certain different other thing, you wouldn't be sitting in that chair. If you believed what I believe, totally. you wouldn't be sitting in that chair. And that, the, the, the system that you're talking about is the one that enforces that kind of thing, right? That, that enforces an ideological uh, discipline um, from, from these people. I mean, that's like, you know, Hillary Clinton is being, it's not, she's not being paid off to change her views on anything. She's being rewarded for her views. Is that if that makes sense? Yep. And that sends yeah. a, a message to everyone else 
that if you have these views, you too will be rewarded. Um, so that that's how that's how the corrupting uh, influence works. It's not like it's not like here's a piece of paper, change everything you believe in to adhere to these principles. It's, it's, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're ab you're absolutely right about that. And also, I mean, so yes, the money gets paid uh, to like-minded individuals. But then on the back end, you also have to acknowledge that uh, someone like Hillary Clinton, most people, people in general, are not going to want to bite the hand that feeds totally. after the fact, especially knowing that that is, you know, a lucrative source <laughs> of income for you um, and is likely to be so uh, when you're no longer serving in government, right? Because that revolving door is an issue. Like the revolving door, when you look at uh, look, Crowley, the person that, um, you know, AOC beat uh, in, in New York, what did he do immediately after um, losing to AOC? He went and started working for a lobbying firm where he's paid handsomely, right? Because they they want to do something. They want to earn money after the fact. Oh, yeah. And so a lot of them end up being lobbyists. A lot of them end up uh, serving on boards of giant banks, all sorts of things that are lucrative and work against us. But that kind of thinking, again, corrupts their decision making when they're supposed to be serving us. And so, yeah, it, it is a huge problem. And to just simply brush this off as, oh, it's a misogynistic attack. Come on, please. You guys do better. You guys need to do better. Yeah. And and I I hate I hate saying that they're intentionally doing it um, to kind of clear uh, Yellen's name here. But some of them are. I, I think it's definitely cynical. Um, I think there are some people who want to be good people, and so once they see that uh, people are arguing that it's misogynistic, um, they'll get scared and say, Yeah, yeah, it's definitely misogynistic. But no. People have been criticizing both men and women who engage in this kind of behavior. It, this is not a female situation. This is not a misogyny, um, you know, story about misogyny. It has everything to do with, again, corruption, conflicts of interest, and what, what we need to do to acknowledge it and, and fight it. Um, anyway, <laughs> that was a long segment. Sorry, I just had a lot to say about it because I can't stand... Uh, and I've experienced it firsthand uh, when it comes to, let's say, uh, progressive candidates who want to challenge um, incumbent corporate Democrats. First thing you see uh, by establishment press and corporate press is ridiculous, uh, defamatory attacks alleging that the progressive is sexist or mm -hmm. is racist or is mean to his or her workers, like whatever they can think of um, to smear that person. But at the end of the day, this isn't about identity politics. This is about, again, doing something to root out the flaws that we're seeing in our system. And I'll stop talking now. now. No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Take go it off. Away. Go off, queen. That, that's what, <laughs> I, tell, off, that's what queen. I tell Janet Yellen to defend her uh, when she's uh, speaking to Wall Street. <laughs>